Okay. I wanted to see if uh, we are all awake. We're ready to start as soon as the door closes. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Clement Manuku. I am with the Northwest University. We are, of course, here to discuss the language policy. The university is in the process of uh, revising almost all its 70 or so uh, policies, and the, the language policy is one of them. However, the language policy seems to be the most critical. Uh, we're receiving lots of uh, feedback and comments about that, and uh, hence, engagements like these are important. May I just indicate that there is a language policy planning task team that was uh, appointed by uh, Senate. It's reporting to the University Management Committee and in the end, the University Council is the custodian of the language policy and all other policies. So approval will be by Council. The Vice Chancellor, Prof. Den Khwadi will be leading us in the discussion. He will speak uh, for an hour or so. After that, we'll have uh, input from the floor. There is also a session happening on our digital uh, platforms. May I just indicate to those who are using the platforms that we encourage robust debate. We obviously need these discussions to arrive at solutions. Therefore, let's respect each other. I am looking at the digital uh, media team and saying to them, we do not plan to delete anyone's comments. I know our stakeholders are very mature, are very uh, incisive in their discussions, and we welcome that. At the end of the day, let's move towards a solution as all South Africans always do, find a South African way to a complex issue. Prof. Khwadi. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Clement. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, uh, welcome, welcome to this session. Uh, just wouldn't, just Prof. Um, they are Interpreting services, uh, I'm told there may be some who are uh, hard on that. If you, you need that, just indicate, the colleagues will assist you. Thanks. Yeah, good. Yeah, th this is not a, a consultation session. There will be consultation processes uh, under the leadership of the task team. So what I really needed to do on behalf of management was for us just to, to set the frame for, for the language uh, uh, debate and uh, the process of, of uh, the, the revision of our policy. And also to, to really indicate, the, to, to guide everyone in, as to what are the sources for what, what, what is it that must inform the revision of our policy. Uh, it is a robust debate as Clement has indicated not only robust, but you have you are also aware that it's it's very emotional. You know, when you look at the comments every time, they they are so racially polarized, and I think sometimes it may not necessarily be the case. But uh, we do understand where we come from and where the emotions actually come from. I think you will see many a times when you read, people oscillate. Between between English only and Africans only, you know? And I think as the Northwest University, we must be able to say, where do we stand? Where is the guidance from the statute uh, taking us to as far as these two different positions are concerned? Is, is, are we looking at a policy that says this is going to be a monolingual English university? And I'm not talking of a campus, talking of a university. 
people tend to many a times also think that we are designing a policy for the Portage Room campus. We are talking of a unitary institution. So the policy is for the university. That must also be clarified. And I, that's why they always oscillate between monolingual English or monolingual Africans. And unfortunately, this, this debate, this policy revision comes at a time in the country where I think the politics is also so more or less polarized, I guess, because of different factors. I guess, to be honest, we know the impact that the discussions around the land grab have been as far as the politics is concerned. More or less, people tend to think, oh, it's just the land grab, and it's also now the language grab coming. And I would imagine we cannot debate these things in isolation of the total environment out there. And hence, therefore, a very racialized uh, debate, which is unnecessary because we know the issue of Africans. I've always said that uh, the, the majority speakers of Africans, as we all know, are actually not Africaners. They, you know, according to the state South Africa, we depart from the point that uh, it's only 40% of the African speakers who are Africaners. 60% are not. And uh, it, it may be a shocking statistic. But of course, this does not rule out the possibility of, 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 of a language being, uh, being assigned and associated to Africaners. The other thing, of course, is uh, the political aspect of this debate. Historically, we know, as, as, a, as South Africans, the, the impact that the 1976 had on, on the perceptions about Africans itself, you know, uh, that it, it, it developed or sort of established itself in the minds of us, many in the country, as the language of the oppressor, and as, as a language that was also enforced down to, to the non-African speakers. So that also creating a platform that contaminates our, our discussions of, of this language at the moment. So hence you see quite a lot of propaganda also going on uh, in, in terms of the comments, uh, people think that uh, the, 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 this, this policy is actually meant to do away with the Africaners on, on our campuses, to now bring in only English uh, at the disadvantage of, of Africaners. But at the same time, it's, it is also a view that its presence and its priority, as it has been historically, has also now disadvantaged the non-Africaners. Non we have seen also recently, and uh, the media has been on, on, uh, on our case about the petitions or the, I would imagine it's a referendum or petition co conducted by solidarity about the views on the Africans, the, the language policy at our university. I will, I, will, I will also touch on those issues. So I just want to go to these few slides. I'm not going to make this a lecture that is loaded with slides, but uh, we just want to guide you. On the first slide there, Robert, these are the, this is the context in which we look at our language policy. We want to see what does the Constitution say and how are we guided by the Higher Education Act and also, obviously, the language policy of the country, which is the Higher Education policy. Then from there, we look at our context in the, in, in, in the, at the university. We had a, an LLB review that also guided us in terms of where we stand as a university and how we need to consider our, 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 our tuition or how we actually need to consider application of our policy. Then, of course, there's been also other developments regarding the uh, the Free State case, the ruling of the Concord and the Free State case and what does it mean to us, and uh, the Northwest University Statute and our own strategy. So everybody who wants to make a comment on our language policy must consider all these inputs. If your input 
is not considerate of this and you are not even informed by that, I would uh, immediately say it may be irrelevant because you might likely take a, a line that is not going to add value or that is not in line. If, if, if the input is not in line with our statute, it is not even a non-starter. Our statute is not up for revision. The statute has been promulgated by the minister, so our policy must also be in line with the statute. And of course, the minister would have not signed the statute if it was not in line with the act. And obviously the act takes its cue from the constitution. I always say our constitution we know, the preamble of the constitution says South Africa belongs to all who lives in it. And if we take it from that point, that the same thing I always say, the Northwest University, also it's a university for all its students. It belongs to all our students. So therefore, we cannot have a university or any of our campuses that does not belong to all as such. So we take our preamble, our cue from, <coughs> from, from the constitution as such. So therefore, any, any attempt to want to preserve a campus for a particular language preference or if, even for that matter, if it was for a particular race, we don't even have to argue its constitutionality. It is completely unconstitutional. So these are some of the cues that I say we've got to be guided by as and when we make our inputs on the, on the language policy. <clears throat> now going on the statutory framework, uh, the constitution obviously says we've got, uh, it, it provides and secures the rights for us or for anyone to receive education in the official language or in the language of their choice, you know? So, so that, that is a constitutional right, but also what is important is also to note that as far as it is reasonably practicable. Uh, I'm not a legal person, I don't want to go into those legalities, I want to say we must also note that while the right is there, there's also a practicality attached to that right, and uh, we need to take note of that. And of course, what it is important is also to note from the Constitution that there is an aspect of equity, there's an aspect of practical, practicability, and also the redress of the racial uh, imbalances or the discriminations of the past. So these three important things must be noted as and when we make our, our policy. <coughs> <coughs> now from the Higher Education Act, we know the minister is to be advised by CHE in terms of the language and many other aspects of uh, every policy that we look at. And as far as uh, that uh, advice is concerned on the policy, we, we know that uh, the, the minister has already received a number of advices and as far as the CHE is concerned, Subject to the policy determined by the minister, the council with the concurrence of the Senate must determine the language policy of public higher education institution and must publish it and make it available on request. We know at this stage that the current policy that stands is the 2002 one and it is currently under review uh, registrar and uh, the current one has got very clear aspects and directives that it gave. In terms of the current policy, we, diversity is, is encouraged. Linguistic diversity, it's very important for us to note that. And that is where we also stand as a university. And <coughs> it was also discouraged in terms of the current policy to have uh, institutions that are designated to a single medium or Africans medium institutions. That was a current situation as determined back in 2002. So any, any, any request to or attempt to have a Africans public institution was also addressed back then in 2002 that uh, the disadvantages of that would actually discourage the diversity that the country would encourage and also of course uh, also not even, not even give, uh, what do you call it, promote uh, multilingualism. 
So to have an Afrikaans monolingual university, it's against the, 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 the policy in the sense that multilingualism will not flourish under such. And uh, yes, what was important was also to note that the indigenous languages must also be, be promoted. Now, if we come to nearer home, the, our experience was with the LLB review. And the LLB review was very clear to say, hey, there are a number of challenges that were brought by, by the language. Of course, our interpretation service, uh, according to that, there were perceptions that the quality thereof also needs to be addressed. And if I have to quote these two paragraphs from the LLB review that says, in the view of the quality of the interpretation services uh, was generally not high. The quality of the interpretation services was generally not high and that the interpretation was a hindrance to their active engagement in class discussions to the extent that they felt disconnected and therefore disengaged from the class discussions. And these were the non-Africans speaking students. So we need to also take note of, <coughs> of those concerns. Then there was also another concern that, of course, there was perhaps a little bit of uh, being insensitive for, 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 for the non-African speaking students. Uh, basically, it says here the, 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 the black students uh, in that uh, the, I think staff also needed to be a little bit sensitive in terms of, of their constitutional right to, to dignity. So this is a fact that was there in our report, but of course we indicate here that it was a perception that, that uh, the, the CHE derived as they came here for our own review. Now, you will pick up on the few issues there. The, on the constitutional court ruling on the free state issue, this is very important also to take note of, that uh, it is absolutely impossible, this is what the court said, it is absolutely impossible to provide language of choice without directly discriminating on the basis of race. Now this issue here connects language to race. We know, and as I've said in my introductory remark, that the majority speakers of Africans are actually not Africaners. But of course, at some point, the language debate, there's always a proxy for race in how it is implemented. And we, we've always been uh, condemned of that at times at, uh, at our Northwest University. So let's take note of that as and when we make these comments or uh, our inputs to this. Now the Northwest University statute, ladies and gentlemen, says our policy must always make sure that it considers the redress of the language imbalances and it must be flexible, must promote multilingualism, must promote access, and of course, integration and the sense of belonging. That I think is also very important. Integration and the sense of belonging. So therefore, whatever policy we come up with must never make anyone feel more at home than the other. And if it gets to that point, then we will have not been consistent with our own statute. And uh, I guess our strategy, if we go to our strategy, our success model also in encourages the same. Our strategy encourages sense of belonging, it encourages a supportive learning environment and experience. It also encourages functional multilingualism. <coughs> so all these aspects are in line with our statute. I'm just repeating them here so that we know where we get our success model from. So our language policy must also therefore encourage and promote the success, the, 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 the success model of the university. It also talks, talking about people's profile, there you'll see that uh, in terms of that, it also encourages diversity. And diversity in terms of nationality as well, because we have also committed ourselves there 
to a 15% international student component. And if it's 15% international, we then also know that the debates are then not only about English and Africans or Setswana, Sezulu to them. They also come with different languages. So the organizational culture for us is so important. It encourages inclusiveness. So inclusiveness must also, the policy must make sure that uh, our, the way we design our language does not appear to be exclusive and participation and collaboration. And as I've said, we value diversity in terms of our institutional culture. I'm just going to quickly show you the figures here uh, in terms of the language composition for the Northwest University. Uh, you will notice from 2014 until 2018, uh, when you look at Afrikaans as a language, the speakers of Afrikaans in our university, the numbers have been going down from 16,000. There you will see almost down to 14,000. And then if you go and look at English, of course, then the English speakers, you see a very steady increase there. And uh, the other indigenous languages, you'll see how we are performing there, except when it goes to Sesotho, you start to see the number of Sesotho students going up. This is total Northwest University. And you will know the Sesotho number, numbers will actually be going higher because of our Val campus. I'll show you the campus distributions shortly. And Setswana, of course, being in the Northwest province, that is a, the indigenous language predominant there is Setswana. And the numbers have been increasing as well, you see, from eight to 10,000, which is almost the same increase that is the, with the decrease in the African speaking there. Uh, I'll take you then to the different campuses. Let's look at the Mafeking enrollments. This is now also between 2014 and 2018. You see Mafeking picks up at Setswana. We still have predominantly the Setswana students there at Mafeking. And then uh, uh, English, you'll see it's also very small there, but more than Africans. So there are very few Africaners, but a bit more than the, the English speaking students there at Mafeking. Which is true, the opposite then of, of what we have at Mafeking, predominantly Africans. And then you'll see Setswana also picking up there a little bit. So. <coughs> but there's a whole distribution of other language speakers there. If you go to Val, the Val campus, you see it picks up there at uh, Sesotho speaking. And then uh, the Africans has been going down also from at the Val campus. But you see the Val is so uh, diverse because you'll see there's quite a number of uh, Zulu speaking and you'll see also Setswana speaking, and uh, unknown, Prof. Linda, I'm not sure what will unknown they indicate. Is it because of international students? <coughs> That's international students, and um, now international students would be under other language. If it's not one of the official languages, unknown where they simply did not complete that section. Great. Thanks. And then, colleagues, let's look at the last table there in terms of uh, the, the 2011 uh, stats as a uh, statistics. You will see from that, uh, oh, 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 this one is first on the interpreting services. Uh, let me show you on the interpreting services. This is how we've been performing as the Northwest University. Uh, we have been having an interpretation from English to Africans, and these are the number of modules from 2017 to 2018. The number of modules then that were translated or interpreted from English to Africans declined from 518 modules then to 456 modules. <coughs> and then there's been an increase from 35 modules to 52 modules that were now translated or interpreted from English to Africans. So ideally, in a functional multilingual uh, environment, our interpretation 
would actually go in all directions. It will be an interpretation that goes either from English to Africans or from Africans to English in terms of our application of the multilingual policy. The next uh, slide, I just want to show you in terms of the population here, the Africans speaking the 2011 states in South Africa out of a 51 million population, it showed that uh, we were about 6.9, almost uh, 7 million were Africans speaking. And uh, you can see how the distribution goes, of course, the Zulus are the, big, the largest in number, they are about 12 million. And then uh, you will see the distributions then around the rest. Now I'm showing you this now saying, uh, there's, a, there's a, a referendum recently conducted by Solidarity and uh, <coughs> the, the media always wants to know our views on that. That 61,000 people have indicated their preference to Africans being the medium of instruction at, at Porsche's room, or they even say primary language. And remember, in a functional multilingual <coughs> policy, you, can, you cannot have the so-called primary or secondary language. Because the minute you, you anchor one language as primary, then it receives priority. Then that is the language that more or less uh, becomes a privileged language. So we will not really have that in our, our strategy of a primary or secondary languages. So we would want all languages to receive the same, same uh, status, so to say. Now, but however, on the 61,000 uh, response by solidarity, if you look at that, to say if it was 61,000 of the Africans speaking uh, community, you are saying 61,000 of almost 7 million African speakers. So that's not really a significant figure to, to, to really go by. And of course, the university being a national asset, you cannot necessarily say uh, 61, now you will say out of almost 51 million in the country. So that number is highly negligible. It's really insignificant. Uh, that, that, uh, that has been my <coughs> my take on, on, on that. But however, the referendum issue, it's, it's also very sensitive. I, we, we cannot necessarily go by, by uh, the, the, the results, the outcome of the majority in terms of any outcome on the referendum. Now my take has always been, if something is unconstitutional, there's no point to take a referendum on it. If, if anybody wants to check if uh, it, it is possible to take anyone to the sea, uh, you know, anybody must go back into the sea. Uh, that is not even a referendum issue. Whatever outcome you get, if you, you are to conduct that, I'm always of the view, depending on when one does that, you might actually get far more than 61,000 people. But if our constitution does not even allow it. It's, it's a non-starter because South Africa is for all those who live in it. It belongs to all of us. So therefore, to try and see if uh, that is a view that can be encouraged, it's almost uh, ridiculous, basically. We just have to say, how do we comply with our constitution? How do we make sure that the country belongs and everybody has a sense of belonging? And the same thing we would want to make sure of the Northwest University. In terms of all our policies and practices, how do we ensure that everybody has a sense of belonging here? Of course, we may have also have heard of opinions and views that uh, we can keep one of our campuses exclusively for Africans because there are 30 other, 30 something other campuses and universities that are English speaking. So we already know how unconstitutional and ridiculous that can be because a university must also be available. If we want to say the students from around here must go elsewhere uh, because uh, we want to have an exclusive language preference for any of our campuses. That, that will also be very unconstitutional. I've always said <coughs> of the three campuses of the Northwest University, we do not have programs duplicated across all of them. 
and therefore we need to have access to all those programs for everyone irrespective of the, the language uh, preferences. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all I wanted to say as far as the direction is concerned. You can see from this, we are not actually saying there's a particular conclusion, decision that we have come up to as management, the consultation process will guide us to that. But if the consultation outcomes does not fall within these broad terms, then definitely uh, it will not be in line with our statute and it may not even be in line with the constitution, if not the act or the higher education act. Thank you very much. <coughs> okay, thank you very much, President. <coughs> Um, we obviously have the, uh, some members of the language policy planning task team. May I see your <coughs> hands? Yeah. So some of these questions that will be coming via the digital media and also on the floor, you will be uh, required to make input. And uh, yeah, I think let's, let's go. Uh, the floor is open for engagement. Let, I'll, I'll uh, open for, let's have a round of three questions. Uh, I'll encourage for the sake of time. Let's, let's, let's stick to the, the, the issue at hand. And also I know sometimes it's necessary to contextualize the question, but let's do as little contextualization as possible so that then everyone can have an opportunity to engage. Uh, oh, I saw a hand, Jacques. <coughs> Are those the two? I want to the third. You are waiting for the opener. <laughs> okay, let's go. Yes, chair. I I um, just want to know the status. You know, the draft uh, policy document, if I'm correct, was circulated among faculties, mm -hmm. and we were asked to collate inputs from colleagues and make submissions which I think all of us have done. Now, uh, have, those, have those inputs been, been collated or I mean, I mean, summarized? And is there, is there a new draft that is going to be? So what is the status of that work in relation to this exercise? I, I'm just trying to understand. OK, so that, uh, to, to clarify this point, in order to, to avoid similar questions or related questions, this uh, session here has nothing to do with the formal consultation process. The issue you are raising is within the communicated uh, process where the task team, not even the VC, the task team is consolidating the inputs and they will be uh, going through a process of making sure that everyone's uh, comment is accounted for Senate will come to the picture council, and also I think we are still engaging with the student structures uh, in that formal uh, 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 process. So uh, I just wanted so that we don't confuse and repeat so uh, 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 certain things. This is separate. This is just to clarify matters, and also because they are not to clarify, just from the what is the basis of uh, the uh, revision of the policy and so on, yeah. Okay, Jacques. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, may I make a small submission in framing the debate or is this only questions now the first round? Can I make a small submission? All right. So if I think in, the, in, in light of uh, ups, the absence of any hand, uh, do both. Thank you kindly. So firstly, I think um, as, as the, the topic today is, is framing the language debate, we should look at, at this debate in a specific, um, so a specific set of glasses. And firstly, I think we should need a criteria as well by which any submission is made should be evaluated. My suggestion for that would be the two main things in our vision statement is firstly, striving for academic excellence, and secondly, a commitment to social justice. Now, firstly, when we're speaking about the academic excellence part of it, and you look at our world rankings, that is really our true mission to move up from 
if we are eighth or wherever up to, you know, to, we want to see ourselves in the top five in the next five to ten years. That's really the vision that we are striving for. But when I look at the world ranking, I see the top 100 <coughs> universities in the world all get the opportunity to study in their home language. And I think that is something that multilingualism makes possible for us, is that option to study in your home language. And we saw as well how the whole um, country and even our students, the demographics look, you know, how many of them are English home language. And I think Multilingualism makes the, the provision for that. The second thing would be also that when we look at the commitment to social justice also, um, that firstly, I think one of the main tasks of a university is nation building also, where we have a country with 11 official languages. We are rich in diversity also. And I think a university's responsibility is to retain of the, the knowledge that are you know, vested in those languages and also to help build on that. And I think multilingualism is the answer to that going forward. I also think that it provides the opportunity to study in one of those 11 official home languages. And I would love to see how we develop that at more institutions. And I like the direction the NW is going with this. And then lastly also, I think also a last submission when in framing the discussion, I think it's better to broaden access to a right rather than having an approach of restricting access to a specific right as well. Unfortunately, I've seen many other institutions go that direction, but it's something that I really think the NW should pride itself on. And also just for clarity's sake, um, if I'm correct, our statute explicitly says that we are a multilingualism institution, and so that is nothing out of that is in the question. Not monolingualism in any other language. It is multilingualism going forward. Okay, thank you, um, Prof. <coughs> thank you, Chairperson. Um, mine is a clarity-seeking question uh, because I'm getting a little confused. People are talking about multilingualism, multilingualism, and then framing that multilingualism within a context of bilingualism. And that is problematic. That is problematic for me because if we talk about multilingualism, it assumes that there are already functional languages that can operate at the same level from an ethno-linguistic perspective and its vitality. And I don't think that that is the situation. So perhaps we need to distinguish between the ideal and the current situation because it is very easy to conflate the bilingual operational environment within a context of multilingualism, which is not yet at a functional level. And that will simply just lead the discussion astray. So I think we need to, to whittle down some of uh, these conceptual frameworks about multilingualism, via v, bilingualism, uh, and then take it from there. Because if we talk about multilingualism, it's more than two languages. And the question would be, is Northwest University at the current moment operating with more than two languages that are fully functional? And the answer is no. But that is the ideal that we envisage within our document. So I, I think, I, think we, we simply, I just needed some kind of clarity ar around those things, Chairperson. Okay. Uh, you can make a comment if you so. Oh, okay. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to raise a similar question. Um, speak of multifunctional, maybe a uh, lingualism. Um, I am tempted to ask the question to say, for example, at the Mafiken campus, I looked at the demographics and everything, where majority of the students are Sitswana-speaking students. Um, how many of them, I don't know if this is the right point, how many of them maybe are taught or are using Sitswana as a medium of instruction and learning? Just a clarity question. Yeah, I think, uh, Prof, uh, Mashudu, you're making a very valid point, distinguishing between the ideal and the, the current situation. And it is important for us to plan. So when we deal with the language policy, we need to also be projecting into the future, leaving that room for us to be able to develop, uh, you know, Setswana. Particularly, we can look at many other languages, but for us being in the Northwest, then Setswana will then be perhaps the language of focus for development. <clears throat> so indeed, that is what we need to look at. But uh, our policy must not limit us. It must actually open us that opportunity for us to, to, to develop the other languages. 
So I guess you, 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 are, you are spot on on that one. However, I think the students will always tell us, let's be practical here. You know, we can talk of Setswana, Zulu, and how we need to develop them. They are now here in class. They are being taught now. They are evaluated at the end of the year. So what medium and how do we approach the language such that to both students in class, all the students will be able to say to us, look, there is in terms of social cohesion, firstly, we, 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 we promote that. And there is also social justice. There is also a question of you know, pedagogical arguments. Are, are we really providing them tuition in a way that will say both of them they are getting value for money, irrespective of their language of understanding and preference? The value for money is also one of those issues that we have to answer to in terms of how we provide tuition. <clears throat> okay. Another framing. Actually, I'm concerned when I see uh, our uh, professors being the only one speaking. I need to see a balanced, more from the student side. Um, as I, I, I ask our digital media to prepare those uh, few questions that we will address, uh, Prof. Badia. No, I was just thinking, uh, uh, taking uh, the cue from the last point, which uh, the last two speakers, uh, you know, have echoed. Uh, I mean, when we say framing the debate, I think what we are now saying is creating the context, and the context of this debate should therefore, uh, you know, be created. Uh, I mean, the the context is, you know, is about the need to to create a framework I mean, that caters for multilingualism, you know, in its broadest, in its broadest, you know, sense. And with that in mind, we need to, you know, simultaneously. Uh, speak about the promotion of African languages and the usage of African languages here, you know, at Northwest University. So I think the context is as much, uh, you know, important uh, for framing the debate. Okay, just to clarify, to, to contextualize, recontextualize <laughs> your context, um, the 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 African languages that I I believe will be talking about in this context will be Setswana and Sesotho because those are the ones that the university has uh, chosen as its official languages. Okay. Am I making sense? <laughs> okay, are there questions that we need to address? Uh, Greg, Rudy? Let's address Paul. I think I've seen lots of uh, Pauls. Who's, who's Paul that I can choose? Oh, okay, let's, let's. Hmm? Okay, in the meantime, Robert. One of the questions on the Twitter feed that I think maybe the members of the language um, task team could address is this question, what is the difference between the language policy and the language plan of the university? That question has come up a few times, and, and maybe we could address that. What is the difference between those two concepts? Okay. Um, respond. You know what, <coughs> shall we, shall, perhaps before we come to that, let's, because also Jacques raised the issue of academic excellence, which to me talks to the teaching learning environment. Per perhaps the chairperson of the task team, who happens to be the DVC teaching and learning, can contextualize within the classroom situation, uh, if you don't mind, Prof. Uh, Robert. Sure, so we know that um, high levels of literacy are correlated with high levels of academic success in the mother tongue or in the home language. And so any university that is aiming to commit beyond access to student success should be aiming to support student success through the home languages. 
Now, that could be a policy standpoint. The operationalization of a policy standpoint like that would involve investment in the development of re language resources in the home language of the students, precisely with a view to giving them the choices to access that kind of support towards better understanding of the academic content that enables them to achieve a greater level of academic success. So there's an example providing a policy position and how a planning position could be taken to support the realization of a commitment to student access and student success through the use of indigenous languages. Okay. Jacques? Um, I would like you to ask a more of a hypothetical question, also looking back. Um, I'm correct in stating that we have had a multilingualism um, language policy since 2004, am I correct? Um, I would just like to inquire going forward. Let's say for argument's sake, the, the policy stays exactly the same as it is. I would like to add on to the question that has been raised earlier. Currently we have on the Porch of Strum campus, there are active use of interpreting services in the class to provide broader access to the education that's being given. I'd like to ask specifically looking at the Mafi King campus where more than 80% of the students there um, are fluent in home language in Setswana. I would like to know why hasn't there until this far, you know, more been done to ensure that they have that access and let's hypothetically the language policy stays the same. Will that going forward change in any way or, you know, what would be the approach to be from there forward if our approach would be to broaden access rather than, you know, narrow it down? Let's take the, the two uh, leaders here and uh, Prof. Dan will respond. Okay. Um, unfortunately, in our context, we can never ignore that in the past, language was used as a filter to divert certain students. For example, you'll always see that Porsche will be predominantly Africans, uh, Mafiken will be predominantly Situan, whereby English will be, uh, Val will be predominantly and so to speaking people. And now, one of the questions that all of those students <coughs> who are in Mafikeng, for example, and who are in the Val, now you will find that their home language can be either Sitswana or Sisud. But having to come to, to the Val campus, you have to adapt or you are taught in English. English whereby is not your mother tongue, but you are adapting. We are adapting in classes with English. Now, then you find that someone maybe in the context of the Porsche campus, then you went to maybe you were taught in Africans from primary, secondary. Then you get to university, you are still taught in Africans, which is your home language. I, as a Zulu speaking person, I'm at the Val campus. I'm taught in English. English is not my home language. I'm adapted to English. But I am supposed to compete with the very same person in Pochestrom campus who is taught one in, in their home language, secondly, who understands everything in their home language while I have to, I have to adapt. Now, English is not my second language. It's my fifth or fourth or fifth language that I'm adapted to use. And, and, and equally important, we, nev we must never distend ourselves from the part of redress. Now, if the very same policy speaks of redress, flexibility, um, uh, open doors, imbalances of the past, that means that there was a certain problem with the use of access. Practically, the, the project from campus, the issue of access still was a problem because of language. Then let's go back for practical evidence, which what you spoke of, Jack. When you go to the student culture and climate survey, when we, when, when we evaluated, then we asked students at the Pochettum campus, now, do they feel as if they are accommodated or do they have a sense of belonging at the Porsche campus? They said no. And those very same students were students who are non-African speaking students. The very same students who were non-African speaking students. So the issue of language cannot be ignored one in academic reasons, secondly, even for a person of color to feel integrated in a university, which is a national asset. Okay. Uh, if we keep the same policy, wholly comfortable, if things remain the same and you're comfortable, you have no, you have no um, urge, Uguti, you must change that, the problem that other people are facing. So, we must change, it is for us to have, it remains the same, we, it doesn't really uh, make sense that we have 
the same policy, or let's say hypothetically we keep the same policy, if it does happen that we do keep the same policy, there will be no redress. We are failing the other points of the statute. So are we choosing to fail the statute or are we choosing to address things head on? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Prof, Prof Linda and then Prof Dan will, will, will talk. Um, I just have to give context to what um, Tukozani was saying now um, because during our student event, um, the white Afrikaans speaking students on the <coughs> campus, um, and it was mentioned more than once, said that this general feeling that, that on the campus they feel tolerated, not uh, appreciated. That was one of the recommendations that came from the uh, report. So I think um, that's something that we have to be concerned about, about all minority groups in ca on, on campuses. Um, so I think we should not just use sport, but we should, should also turn the eye to the minority groups on the other campuses. Okay. Yeah. I'll ask uh, Prof. Prof. Den to make comments, and then after that, the next session will focus on the tweets. And uh, it's not going to be only Prof. Den addressing the tweets. So, uh, what this is a—it's a—it's a debate. Let's engage. So, if you see a tweet around there, you are welcome to comment on it. To you know, take the the the, 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 the engagement further. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I was actually looking at a few tweets there. I saw uh, the, the mo most of the comments really depart from a very stereotypic point of view. You know, we, we must understand as a university, we, we are not boxed in any ideological debate. Our departure point for the policy is not ideological. It is based on policy and the, the strategy that says we have an institution that must create an environment conducive for learning for all our students. And if you depart from that point of view, and an institution that says we anchor everything that we do on social justice, that will never allow us to operate from sectorial uh, interests like I see some people belonging to certain boxes and sectors uh, arguing from. Unfortunately, we can't. We, we, we have to, leading an institution that is a national asset, we've got to make sure that access to this national asset, asset uh, is uh, available for everyone. There's a question here that says, uh, <clears throat> why do I hate Afrikaans students? I mean, you, how, how do you hate someone on the basis of language? That, that completely is out of order. That is, I'm sorry to say that. That's very ignorant of anyone to think that someone can be, hate another one because of language. And if, you, if anybody thinks because there's management here, we've got preference on basis of race, then he can just go get lost. That's not how we operate and run this national asset called the Northwest University. <clears throat> so we are genuinely engaged in a, in a process <coughs> that, that, that will create a conducive environment or continue to promote a conducive environment to all our students, irrespective of color, gender, or language. So that, that's basically where we are. Thanks. Okay. Can you, there is this question that I would want us to respond as a matter of agency. This is because it talks to the fundamentals. Please explain the difference between a language policy and a language plan. I think that's where you come in. Yeah? <coughs> you want? Oh. Sorry. Propelfo did to some extent explain in broader terms, but I think if I can summarize it in two or three sentences, the policy makes principal statements and then the plan unpacks how those principles contained in the principal statements are operationalized or implemented. So we move from a more theoretical statement to the implementation. 
the practical implementation of those statements. Okay, uh, Registra. Chair, I do not want to really pick up on the difference between the policy and the plan. I think your honors has uh, covered that sufficiently. Uh, I want to pick up on the, on the, uh, the, the references on uh, the, uh, the reason why we revise the policy. Um, and if we don't do so, why don't we do so? And I think the, the answer lies in the statute provision, Chair. We need to take also a view on the history of the language policy. We've had our first language policy, I think, um, approved in 2007, in line with the, with the, the uh, statute, as Prof. Dan has <coughs> indicated, the 2005 statute, where the same words kind, kind of occur that's in the new statute. The words flexible, functional, redressing, the imbalances of the past, the promotion of multilingualism, access, integration, and sense of belonging, in fact, do come from the old statute. But the reason why we now need a new process is twofold. Is the fact that we have, um, we have, we in any case have a five year intervals for the revision of all policies at the university. And that's the first thing that we need to do in any case. Secondly, in line with the fact that we have a new statute, we are in any case obliged to take a look at all policies uh, you know, and to get those in line with the statute and then campuses' names and the f new fun functions that we have at the university. <coughs> so the, the, the reason is twofold. Chief, but more importantly to my mind is the fact that if we take a look at how successful we were previously with the, with the, 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 the language policies, is I think we would be fair to ourselves <coughs> if we say that to a certain extent we have succeeded in implementing a flexible and functional multilingual policy. And we, we are, I think we, we succeeded also in promoting multilingualism. But we were not successful, Chair, in the, the overt redressing of language imbalances of the past, of, of really grappling with the notion of language in access and in success, with really, really seeing to what extent we can use multi, uh, the multilingual environment as an asset as so as to, to improve integration and particularly a sense of belonging. In that sense, we, we, it's a, there's a dire, dire need now to really have a new language policy uh, that uh, I'm going to again say overtly um, address these matters and see to it that we, we also attach to them practical measures to be, to be able to measure our success in implementing the policy. So that, to my mind, motivates the fact that we, we need a new policy. We can't say if, if something is not broken, we, we don't need to fix it. We don't say the policy is broken, but, but you know, we, we've moved on. If you take a look at your, your staff card, you don't look the same than, than when this staff card's photograph was taken. We've changed. It's a, it's a factor of life that everything, every living organism changes as life, as time goes on. So we need to be responsive and relevant also in terms of our language <coughs> policy. Thanks. Okay, let's, let's focus on the questions on the board. Did you see any <coughs> that you want to engage? Oh. Yeah, I saw one, I think it's Paul Maret there, he says, <coughs> uh, what relevance does 1976 have in where we are at the moment? So that, that is uh, almost asking what relevance does he history have on us? You, you can't, I think, and Paul is a theologian, he knows better that really history is very important. The minute, if you want to go wrong, you must forget history, lest it repeats itself. And I'm mentioning this because <coughs> We know the, the, the attitude that is there towards Africans. Sometimes we must be very realistic and understand where people come from so that we are able to address some of those issues. So <clears throat> it is as a result of that which failed in 1976, an attempt to impose Africans. So whatever we do will always be seen as, oh, this is now history repeating itself. So if we don't understand what happened in 76, we will not understand the resistance that may come 
perhaps out of an approach that may not be proper. I mean, many a times I hear uh, <clears throat> that Northwest University is going the same route as, as uh, Free State and uh, uh, Techies and, and uh, UJ. And therefore, uh, we are suspected in whatever we do. Just like someone coming from an abusive relationship, you know, if you come from an abusive relationship, the unfortunate one is the next you are going to get into. Because whatever that one does, you always refer to the previous experience. So it's important to have history. If we don't have it, then it will just simply repeat itself. Or we will actually be out of context in the solutions that we want to, to propose. Okay. Are you, please, I'm getting um, <coughs> like not so good messages that I, we are ignoring them and we don't want to lose them. Can we, are we, are we addressing some of the things you see? Huh? Are you addressing this one? Okay, yes. please. Just uh, mention which one so that the, the colleagues will be able to capture that. Now, I think uh, <clears throat> I wanted to maybe educate uh, one of uh, the person that tweeted the, who was asking about relevance of 1976, that uh, there is a place called the Apartheid Museum, and uh, also you can go to Soweto, you would find uh, where they've got the Hector Peterson Museum there. You find a lot of uh, free education that you can get on that and the impact <coughs> of language in terms of uh, geopolitics of this country. But I don't think the Northwest debate is premised on history, but uh, it is premised on the future that it actually promises uh, future students that would come here, that you would come into a diverse environment with uh, people that are committed to multilingualism and you can uh, be assured that that is actually in the statutes of the university in terms of that particular commitment. Therefore, in essence, what we are saying is that uh, we are trying to find a practical way in which everybody would feel that the Northwest is a welcoming environment and also they are not denied access by using language as a proxy for filtering or gatekeeping for any students that want to study in our campuses. Thank you, Chair. Okay. I see another comment uh, here. It says, maybe management must just ask the Africans people to go, to leave the university. <clears throat> uh, I mean, this is also, again, another stereotype, if not only a ridiculous comment, because you, you can't say, if I don't have the privilege, then I must go. Because you prefer to have a privilege over others. And you are not prepared to coexist equally so with others. That's how I interpret the question. If I don't have a privilege, then it means you don't want me. And the argument here is, no, we are not prepared. And I think the policy must not give a privilege over any language. It must rather create a conducive environment where all can coexist and feel at home. <clears throat> okay, please, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Uh, you know, based on one of the comments that was asking about the relevance of 1976, mine, or what I want to, to add, and perhaps even ask is to say, prior 1994, uh, even today, we're still experiencing the consequences of apartheid. And the fact of the matter is that Africans and perhaps English were given preference over the indigenous languages of South Africa or South African black people. Now, my point is uh, English and perhaps Africans they are developed to such an extent that our curriculum can be delivered in those languages. Now, today we were sitting and we were asking if we could promote multilingual uh, 
uh, I, I, I don't know. Maybe curriculum uh, in our in our in our institutions. But my question is: Are our languages on the very same level of quality compared to those of English and Africans? And Prof spoke of value for man. We might sometimes want to rush and uh, uh, have these new African languages in our institution. My question is, are they going to be on the same quality compared to that of Africans, number one? Number two uh, is that when you take a closer look to our basic education, we've been taught in uh, English. We've been taught in English from grade one until metric level. And then suddenly when you arrive in university, you are given a chance to to you know, be addressed or interact with your own home language. I think, again, that is a drastic change. This, I think, is a process that has to be taken very much serious to say, even though you want to introduce uh, multilingual uh, 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 languages in our campuses, uh, is the quality going to be on the same level compared to that of Africans in our institution? And therefore, since our constitution speaks of equality, uh, can we find a common ground or a point of consensus to say, let us not give a certain group of people privilege over the others? And while we still wait, or perhaps even help our government to develop the African languages from a, a grassroots level. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, please switch off the mic. <coughs> so I think the, the, there is a, we, we all, we are on the same page that there is, there is medium of instruction and there is a language, mother tongue. Eh? Uh, and all languages are of high quality. <laughs> okay, I think the issue is medium of instruction and academic use. <laughs> no, I think just so we are on the same page. Uh, Jacques, uh, oh, hey, Dwayne. <laughs> next, next, without me even interrupting. Thank you. I'll be very quick. I just also want to touch on a few things that have been said previously. Um, firstly, I just want to say I agree with what Tokazani has said, that we have to do more effort to redress the past. And hence my question I said previously, why haven't we done enough developing Setswana, specifically on Mafeking, for example, and going forward, in a multilingualism um, setup, are we going to do that or are we going to continue as currently is? And I just would like to mention as well that we have to remember that access to Afrikaans at Ports is more prevalent because it was a monolingual Afrikaans institution for 135 years. So that will exist, you know, taking into, into account, same as Unibo um, having majorities at Swana, that because of the past of it also. However, if the answer is, and I've heard it previously said, to access is not to make access harder for the rest of everybody, but to broaden access is really to empower somebody. And you redress the past when you empower somebody, and you empower somebody when they can study in the home language. If we are going to have an, a mentality of, you know, as long as everybody suffers equally, then we're fine. We're not going to progress going forward. And that is why I would like to commend UKZN. UKZN, since 2030, have made it compulsory to take Zulu when you go study, no matter what you study. And they have made huge leaps in developing Zulu. And I would like the NWU to position itself in doing the same for Setswana and also for Setsutu going forward. So I would also still like to hear going forward, what are our plans practically in developing that? And then um, also, just a last thought, also looking at the future, we have to ask ourselves, where is this country going? If all the universities are just going to go to you know, English, we have to decide now, is it really valuable for us to have a rich diversity in this country that we can start preparing our kids that they can go to in English to primary school and in 30 years from now, we might have four official languages, which Zulu will be among them because UKZN is developing it. But I would like to say more from that going forward. So we have to keep in mind the future when framing and having these discussions. Where do we want to end up at the end of the day? Yep. Thank you. Chair, um, what I would, I'd, I'd really just like to add also what Jog just said. Um, but I think I have a principal problem, um, and I say this with a lot of respect as well, in the way that this whole thing was framed from the get-go. Um, I think it is predicated a lot on a, a sense of um, antagonization towards a specific language. Um, and the thing is, if, if we as assume that 
this whole debate is predicated on the fact that we need to shy away from something like Afrikaans. The rhetoric that we're going to develop here is going to have a specific result. Um, and I, as we proceed, I think it becomes more evident that there is um, an unequivocal uh, incentive from a lot of people in this room to shy away from that. And I don't think that we can objectively frame this debate specifically if it has some if it has a subjective way of thinking in the way that we frame it. So I would just maybe like to also just implore the rest of the people here that we need to have a very objective debate as to that they are, it's a very balanced type of form um, of discourse. But moreover, um, I think that also just maybe to, to, I also saw one of the comments there, but it also sp maybe would spread out to a way that it was also contextualized from the beginning, um, is, it, I don't think that it is justified to refer to the usage of Afrikaans at the Northwest University is an unconstitutional practice. Um, I know in as much as we can assume that things happened at UFS, it was a qualified president. And th what that means is that we need to evaluate the merits based on what happened at that campus and it doesn't necessarily automatically reflect what is happening on ours. Um, so it, it, no presumption can be made that Afrikaans is unconstitutional and if we have to review our language policy that we need to shy away from unconstitutionality. Uh, if we use words like unconstitutionality, you would automatically assume that me wanting to have an established language at a specific campus or whatever the case may be, or at a university, not necessarily a campus, it would inadvertently me being um, an opponent, opponent to social justice, which isn't the case. Um, just like Jock also said, we need to away, find a way to empower everything. I don't also find merits in um, a mentality of because we, uh, there is adaptability or functionality issues, that it automatically negates the functionality and adaptability of one thing. Because Jay, in as much as um, a language can make people feel unwelcome, it also makes people feel welcome. And what's important of that is making an active decision and codify it in terms of legislation or statute or policy would automatically, and like I said, inadvertently, send out a message that you are not welcome. In as much as we can dispute and maybe reject a lot of things that are said on this Twitter feed and messaging on Facebook, it is a reflection of what people think is happening and would, would consequently happen if decisions are made that would negate a specific language. And I don't think that that would be constructive to our university as a whole. Um, and I also maybe have an issue with the fact that Making people feel included and welcome at all three campuses might not only be pra pragmatically impossible, but moreover, I don't think that it should be a metric. Because if I stand, uh, or a first year, a prospective first year of next year say that I feel unwelcome at one of the campuses because they speak English and not one, for instance, my home language, does not deem it a, a measurement or a metric because that would be exclusionary in and of itself. And I don't think that it is something that we should be standing for. Okay, I think let's let's let let me try um, to say the context here is the Northwest University's language policy and plan, which, as it stands, it's also um, it takes the cue from the Constitution from the higher education uh, 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 language policy as well as the university statute. I would want to believe that reference to one specific language is precisely because people are expressing what they feel, their experiences. And therefore, I would want this to be an open discussion no one should shy away from mentioning any particular experience of theirs. Okay, so 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 I, I, I think let's let. Obviously, our our reality here is that we are in the English Afrikaans environment, Setswana Sesotho environment, and therefore I want I don't want I, this is an academic institution. Let's be honest with each other and uh, say those things. But what I want agree to and allow as the chairperson is where uh, there is deliberate attempt to gag somebody 
or there is a deliberate attempt to attack one language. I think that I won't allow. So let's, let's shall we, are we commenting on the, the, the feeds? You know, there are more people outside than us. <laughs> so I want us to, Prof. Robert, uh, before we go to the Prof. Ika, please, colleagues, look at the, 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 agree with what is said or disagree, say, say something. I think it's clear that at NWU, all the languages that we use are welcome. All the languages we use are welcome. And from a teaching and learning perspective, our ideal is that all the languages we bring should be supported from a teaching and learning perspective. The practicality of how we do it is often where the devil in the detail sits. Because to think of languages as associated only with a particular geographical place is a mistaken idea. Certainly we need members of the community around us to support the languages we choose as university to, to develop over time. We need a region we need the communities to support the languages we choose as university. But the languages we choose as university are bridges to learning for all our students. They are not bridges to learning for one particular group and another particular group or a third group. The languages that we make the official languages of the university are the languages that we expect our students as an entire community, not per campus, as a community to access. And that does not simply mean that students get to choose the languages in which they would like to receive their instruction. That cannot be practical because our academics come from all over South Africa. They come from all over the world, in fact. So what is practical? What is practical is that we support our students learning and understanding of the content in the languages that they would like to access from those that the university has chosen as its official languages. So why should we not commit? Why should we not commit to supporting a one language, one campus dispensation? Why is that not a good idea from a teaching and learning perspective? It's not a good idea because to be multilingual does not simply mean allowing people to access education through the language of their choice. It means actively learning the languages that we all use, that we all use, so that we can understand each other better that we can understand our curriculum better, and we can attract to this academic community, academics of quality, as well as students of quality. I would be very hesitant to say, let's only develop Setswana for Mafeking, or Sisutu for, for Val Triangle, or Afrikaans for Potrostrum. That would not be an ideal solution from an education perspective at all. In fact, what we would then have is a parallel monolingualism, not a multilingualism. Thank you, uh, Clement. Linking on in a way to what Robert said, and in a way also responding to one of the tweets, I think it was by Neil De Beer. Uh, Rudy, it was a little bit upwards, not too much. I think you've passed it now. Yes, thank you. I want to start off, uh, uh, colle colleagues, with what is the ideal situation that we would like to see, given all the matters that Prof. Dan mentioned, what is our starting point? The ideal situation is that I would like to see, as soon as possible in the future, that a typical student leaving one of our campuses will typically have had the different modules, about a third of the modules would have had each the language of instruction that we view at this stage as our official languages. 
That would mean in practice that the person leaving any campus will have a third of the modules for that whole program of three or four years. A third would have been in English. A third would have had English as mode of instruction. Would have had Afrikaans as mode of instruction. And for POTS, POTS or it doesn't really matter where, would have had a third in Setswana or in Sesotho. Mode of instruction means uh, then I will leave as a student. I will leave the university having all the knowledge. It will be very clear that utilizing interpretation services is not isolated to one language group, but everybody needs to put those earphones on the ear some or other time. Then also, what we do is, as university, we put our money where our mouths is, are. Of course, it will be, take a lot of money to develop Setswana and Sesotho and other languages. But we have the ability to do that. We have C-text at our university. We have a whole lot of digital resources we can utilize. We can incentivize young academics in Setswana and say what took Afrikaans from 1870 to develop into a scientific language it took them 50, 60 years, right through being oppressed by the English through the early 1900s, eventually coming to a point where that language happened in 60 years. With that knowledge and with good resourcing, we can do the same for Setswana, Sesotho in 15 to 20 years because we put effort, we have the knowledge. So what I would like us is to keep this end in our mind. And as we work towards that, not to deny those who have the privilege to study in home language. That would be the nine or so percent of our students at our university that has English as mother tongue and the about 27 percent of students at our university who has Afrikaans as mother tongue. Our university has the ability to produce modules in those two languages and with an effort we will soon go further than that. And the last point also to, to show our seriousness and I've seen very good signs at many of our residences where there's a concerted effort by our students to learn the languages of the persons in the residence. So extra classes given by buddies to learn Setswana and to be able to speak it, that we go one step further and since we are serious about our multilinguality, let's build into our prescribed modules the ability to master not only English and another language, but also to master Afrikaans, to master Setswana or Sesotho. If that is the route we take, then we will end up with students being graduated who has a well-rounded experience of the languages, and that will make the difference also with an employer. If you go to an employer and say, I can manage three languages, at least two of them I can manage fully, scientifically and professionally. And I have another two or so that I can manage socially and can communicate in. That, to my mind, uh, Clement, is such a powerful end result to strive for that I will put a lot of time and a lot of energy into making that possible. Yeah, I think I, I have rec recognized uh, some members. Colleagues, I think in contextualizing, framing this and discussing, I, I, I'm watching what's happening here. Let's, let's remember that we are South Africans. It is very easy 
for us to move to our individual spaces, spaces that may be comfortable, spaces that may be painful. And if we focus on that, we may not meet anywhere. So as we propose, is it possible that we can say, first and foremost, I acknowledge that I am a beneficiary of a system. And this is how I intend to participate in addressing the injustices. Or I realize that I am one of the people who speak the majority language in the country. I, however, I'm not going to force everyone to do that. And this is how I'm prepared to meet everyone else halfway. Because as we do this, we must always think, remember that we are going to the classroom situation where five of us are speaking different languages. That is the situation that we must always have in mind. How do we make sure that all of the five of us are experiencing the classroom in such a way that we are proud uh, students and so on? Prof? Thank you very much. I want to raise uh, two points, uh, one of which links to uh, what is, has been said and you also alluded to in some way, Chair, uh, that uh, much as in terms of policy, constitution, and all uh, the background information that was given on us focusing on a functional multilingual uh, policy, uh, the reality is that it will have to be a, a done in a phased manner. Uh, 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 because the languages are not on an equal uh, status. And therefore, you would imagine that one would uh, speak of immediate, medium-term, and long-term goals to watch towards achieving that 100% multilingualism in terms of the predominant languages or the languages that have been uh, selected by the university, um, that's one. Two, as an institution of higher learning, we are part of the global community. Yes, we are a South African institution and we have our own unique history and so on, uh, but we cannot leave out the fact that we are part of a global community. As we speak now, we've got students from 60 countries who are part of this university. And they are, they are approximate to uh, around 3,000 students. I believe that part of ensuring access and inclusivity is to consider that aspect as well. And the fact that when we produce graduates in our university, much as we would like uh, them to address societal problems, our, our country pro problems. We also would like them to address the continental problems and we also would like them to address the global issues. So for me, really, we have to think of those complexities and make sure that none of them is left unattended. Otherwise, we will remain with uh, whatever language or languages without a university. Thank you. Okay. Um, I want to hear the other voices as well. And uh, Okay, let's just go the student leadership that side, and then we'll come this way. Thank you, Clement. I would just like to make a submission with regards to the strategy as pointed out by Professor Khwadi. So one of the main um, points in the strategy is the um, sense of belonging. And as you correctly pointed out, there are still people on this university and specifically on this campus who dot, do not feel the sense of belonging. And this is an urgent matter which we truly should address. I would just then ask on the same level, where are we going to say that just the one group and their sense of belonging is 
is important because I think we cannot ignore the fact that many, many, even thousands of students come to this university um, specific due to the fact that they feel the sense of belonging, due to the fact that they can study in their own home language, which is a right they do not have or a privilege they do not have at any other university. So I think when we want to speak about a sense of belonging, we should tr truly strive to a point where we can give the students more options and not take the one option which creates this sense of belonging. By taking that away, we would even make the whole aspect worse. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Uh, uh, Lamant. I just have a quote from Justice Liana Theron on what she said about the language and also a few questions. Um, Justice Leona Theron said that language has complex narration within South African history as it was employed as a tool to create division in a hierarchy of privilege and disadvantage, primarily, primarily by depriving potential learners from, from access to education. However, in our new dispensation, language has the capacity and capability to bring people or students together and to contribute towards meaningful transformation. Um, I just want to know that, okay, just a comment from my side also that, you know, transformation requires access to higher education and moving away from the, fa from the reality that language, especially in this university, is a stumbling block will completely render this kind of plan um, contra transformation. With that said, I think it is the task of the university leaders and the students to investigate an avenue that will make language be an instrument that makes education accessible to all students. My submission or rather question is, how and which way is it fitting to make education accessible to all? Taking in regard that language can never be addressed without linking a culture. I think failure to reach a conclusion to this language policy will amount to not recognizing uh, different cultures. Thank you. There is Raoul uh, Levi Matiba. Are you responding to him? Uh, I think he's, uh, you know, after the the ones I've read here, you know, the idea is not. I think you can see there, um, and that's that's correct. I, 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 in terms of where I stand, I'm not speaking on behalf of the university. It's my personal view that what he's saying there is is correct because. Somebody I'm engaging on here is saying, I hate Africans, and Egbel um, Ferrum say, Danke, that's all. <laughs> because <laughs> I have words, but uh, limited ones in terms of my response to him. Of then. I think uh, the fortunate thing about this debate is it's taking place at a university level. And I think all of us are academics, and we must provide the leadership that is necessary. And as long as we are not prepared to get to compromise situations, there's no way we can ever lead in a polarized environment. Because your comfort zone then becomes a reference. And any attempt to move you to a neutral point or to meet others, you are, one may interpret it as being oppressed. I see quite a number of comments here that talks about 1976 oppression was bad, but now there is another oppression. So when people are moved towards a convergence, they feel that's, that is now them being, being oppressed. It's unfortunate <clears throat> if one derives a sense of belonging uh, on the exclusion of others. That's something we have to understand. How do, you how do we define the sense of belonging? If your sense of belonging is defined in terms of you as an individual and not in the sense, in the context of a collect inclusive, inclusivity, then we need to go on a seminar on that one. And no, we shouldn't be surprised because yes, that's the background we come from. We all come from different backgrounds. I always make an example of people in a one bedroom and they need to sleep. One prefers to sleep with the lights on, one prefers to sleep with the lights off. And they all want to have a sense of belonging. 
how do we solve this? This is how complex the environment is that we are dealing with. We appreciate very well that students come and we can attract students from far afield to this, our university, because they will feel at home. And we also want to equally feel proud to attract those that are right nearby here from Ikahe to also really fight to get into our gates because they will also feel at home. So that is the balance that we have to create as the Northwest University. <clears throat> I saw me. So I'd like to raise two points um, from my personal perspective. The first one is in terms of the Afrikaans speaking students feeling that they do not belong. I'd like to state that the Val Triangle campus, in the Val Tri Triangle campus, the, the language policy there is basically when it comes to exam papers. They are written in both English and Afrikaans. Although the minority is still there, minority of white people still belong there, and majority is here. So even where the minority white people are, I'm sorry to excuse, excuse, excuse my English, this still is a sense of accommodation towards their language. And the second uh, question I'd like to have is, personally, as I'm from KZN, I'm Zulu speaking, I came here at the university. It seems as though the policy is designed to accommodate the new, the new policy that could be invented, is designed to accommodate three languages, which is English, Afrikaans, and Setswana. So isn't that a new form of exclusion for the other African speaking, I mean, African language speaking students that could speak other African languages besides Setswana. Thank you. Okay. Um, make the two comments and then Prof. Robert will, in no particular order, members. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I feel as if. The, the language policy issue, as sensitive uh, as it is, um, but I want us to be as honest as possible with it. Um, I've been looking at, at the comments, and you can never ever have an issue whereby you debate language and not really associate it with race, whether voluntarily or not. <coughs> and majority of people who are conservative in nature or who want to maintain their status quo uh, it is evident that it's mostly these African-speaking people, not that I'm attacking them personally. And when you look at un-African-speaking people, Zulus, or African people in nature, they are saying that we also want access at Northwest University. Now, there's a famous quote that says, someone who's used to preferential treatment when they're treated equally, they take that as being maybe <laughs> prejudice or so forth. And honestly speaking, the issue of language, and also I'm going to refer to the climate culture survey that we had. Now, minority group at the Porsche campus <coughs> felt excluded, felt that we do not belong here, we are just here for the sake of being here. The very same contact at Mafikeng where minority groups, which are African speaking people and other groups, felt that they do not belong at Mafikeng. The very same could be diverted in the Valley whereby minority group, because of language again, felt that they are not accommodated at the Val campus. Now, then fast forward to go to the Porsche campus, whereby particular male African student of the very same campus said that the interpretation system is working good and it is perfect. Now, the very same interpretation system, which is, which is thought of by the very same male groups of the Porsche campus, which is good. Now, the very same non-African students, no, non-African, no, African students of this campus said that we have a problem with the interpretation system. Now, if, if we want to reach harmony so that everyone can feel integrated, everyone can feel accommodated, everyone can have a sense of belonging, then why is it a, a problem if we can all use English, that if anyone has a problem with English, 
feel or as, as, as the white African students may have said in this campus, then they would not have a problem with using interpretation systems. And on top of that, let us go back to dignity. How does one feel dignified if you go to a classroom and you express yourself vividly that you do not know Africans, then you are supposed to an interpretation system. The very same content can be used in the Mafiken campus. If anyone would have a problem with the use of Sitswana, there will be interpretation systems where they will be translated into Africans or English. That way, if I am Zulu, if I am Zwana, if I am Venda, if I'm even any other language, I would never feel excluded, and also this university will belong to everyone. Now, the most, most difficult thing that we have to deal with is that the history of this particular campus, for, that we must be honest. Now, there is a sense of belonging, a sense of identity, which has also been proven by the Student Climate Cultural Survey, whereby students of this campus, when they were asked, how do you identify yourself? One, do you identify yourself in the picture of a university, or do you identify yourself as a campus than as a university? The answer was, I identify myself in terms of campus, then I identify myself in terms of the university. Now, that is culture. And equally important, the very same facilities. Imagine if someone wants to come and study pharmacy, then I cannot come and study ph pharmacy because of language policy. I'm being excluded. If someone wants to, that means even my very tough choice is excluded because on the basis of language. At the Val campus, there's no farmers. At the Mafiking, there's no farmers. Farmers is only at the Posh campus. So, are you saying because only farmers at the Posh campus, I should not come to the Posh campus because of language? And we must be honest and brutally honest with that, that language is still a hindrance. And my last point, many other universities have a went to this part, whether monolingual or multilingual. They've also shown the importance that you can never really, really speak of multilingualism without favoring one group as opposed to the other. If I speak of multilingualism, for example, someone who's African speaking, to you, that is comfortability. It is not even an option, it is luxury because I've, I was taught in that language. For someone who has to translate, who uses that as a second medium of instruction or third or fourth, do we really see that there is multilingualism on the same level? So I think something that we must consider, multilingualism at what level? Is it first class level or second class level? I am saying that now, the issue of functional multilingualism, it has different levels. And for someone who's African speaking, speaking for someone who's Swana speaking, for someone who's even Sutu speaking, that is multilingualism in first class. Then someone who's not belonging to this group, that is second class. Then value for money and tuition is not the same. Um, thank you very much. Um, I just want to um, say something. I, I don't know if I could be clarified if I'm wrong, but when we speak about equity, especially in a society where it has been um, um, skewed to one side and the other side hasn't had um, enough of, uh, doesn't it mean that you have to take from to give to the other? That is what it means to be equitable. If you speak about equity, we must take from to give to the other. So now the problem comes when you look at the three campuses that we have. We have Poch as um, what used to be called the main campus. Now that we are a unitary campus, we are no longer saying it's the main campus. But then you come to a campus such as this, a campus that is beautiful, big, and it has all the facilities that are needed. Um, but majority of the campus, or majority of the people on the campus uh, are white. And that does not necessarily depict the national uh, 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 demographics. It doesn't show uh, what the nation looks like. Because if you come to a campus where there's 70% of white people, can you really, really, really honestly think that we are going to have some kind of, um, we're, uh, we're going to have um, a, 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 an inclusive, um, an inclusive uh, 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 curriculum? Now, how does that tie into language? Language uh, hinders the process of equitably distributing students across the, the, the three campuses. So if we have Africans, I am not willing to learn in Africans. I am definitely not willing. And I'm sure there are other students who would be masters in the fields that they want to learn, but they cannot learn because they refuse to learn in Africans too. So why is it not that we do things um, in a way that everyone is able to, to, to have access to, to the language of their choice, but we have one language of instruction? How does that happen? It means that 
We have English as our medium of, of, of instruction. But if you feel like that was not trans it was not given to you in a way that you can chew up and digest, go and get yourself an Afrikaans textbook. Go and get yourself a Zulu translation. That way you will be able to learn. But now if we're saying that now we are going to have uh, 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 um, two languages and we're going to this class, it, does not, it is not practical because I don't want to learn. It's just a preference. I don't want to learn in, an, in another language. And now I am hindered from learning what I need to learn because I am not willing or I'm unable to learn in that language. So no matter how we look at it, one group must be taken from to give to another. That is the meaning of equity. It is even a privilege that I'm speaking English right now. I'm supposed to speak my home language, which is paid. It is a privilege uh, uh, that, 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 that people can hear me when I speak. It is also a privilege that people learn from their own language, their home language. So in a place where other people are unable to get the same privilege that you are getting, it is your responsibility, it is just human, or it is a form of humanity just to say, okay, let us have a place where the, where the playing fields are level and everyone is given the same opportunity. We are not asking for Africans to be thrown out of the gate. We are asking that everyone be given the same opportunity. Thank you very much. Prof. Robert, uh, please, you were on the line. Yeah, I, if I could respond to the question about <clears throat> do we exclude people when we choose particular languages over other languages? Um, we are um, required by the languages in higher education policy as a university, as are all universities, to identify particular languages to be developed. And to date, UKZN is the most advanced institution in terms of using and developing Isi Zulu for higher education purposes. Of course, we know it is a thriving language outside of the institution, but what make, made that language choice practical for that university is that there is a large language community outside the university that supports that language choice. I think the data that Prof Dan showed about the multilingual character of the Northwest University in terms of Gauteng, Mafeking, Pochestrum suggests we have thriving communities outside the university as well as inside the university that make adopting Setswana or Sesotho both as well as English and Afrikaans viable we can do it but what the previous speaker alluded to, which I think is such an important issue for us to think about, is the medium of instruction matters. So it's one, it's one issue to provide access to the languages, support in as many languages as possible, but the medium of instruction matter is really a critical matter. And then we have to ask ourselves the question, are we willing to learn languages other than the languages we currently use? Whether I'm Afrikaans, English speaking, Setswana speaking, Isi Zulu speaking, am I willing to learn another language as part of what it means to be a university student in this country? And uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know, we are a multilingual society. So my hope would be that we would all be willing to learn a language we do not know because none of us have access to all the languages that we each have access to in this room. And so we need more than one language as a common language. English cannot be the only common language we have in common. Thank you. Okay, let's close this side and then we can come to you doing and then Ms. Diasonville. Yeah, please, uh, you're, you're on the floor, uh, sir. Hey, Jalewa, that thing we less do. I like the fact that you said we should also outline factors of which students encounter like on the ground. There is a point whereby beard students in the Val campus were complaining about the fact that uh, African-speaking students, they were given specific scope 
uh, compared to that one of which was given to the English speaking uh, students, number one. Then number two, there was a point whereby we were in class, there were African speaking students, a few of them, and they were not actively participating in class. And the lecture, when she asked the question, their response was that they don't mind not participating in class because their papers is going to be marked in Africans. So this actually drives me to the point whereby I have to say African students are given privilege. Uh, it's a fact, it's like that. Because our question papers, they're written both in Africans and English. Now, black students have actually uh, submitted to the fact that English is the language that is used in our institutions. And we actually agreed to leave our comfort zones. But the question is now, of which the president of the university has outlined, is that why is it problem for African speaking students to come out from their comfort zone so that we can be on the same level? I mean, like, it's not nice whereby I put my headsets on. The lecturer has already recorded the, the lesson. And then now, when even the lecturer makes a joke, or a joke in class, I can't hear anything. Because now I'm being directly excluded. So we are simply saying that we have to be subjected to one thing. There is never a point whereby many people with different views can be satisfied. Now, we have to end up being subjected to one language. And now, one of the speakers outlined the fact that she comes from KwaZulu-Natal, and her home language is Isizulu. And we are currently speaking of including Setswana and Sesotho. And they are also being excluded at the other African languages. Now, the point is right now, we have to be subjected to one language right now, while the other official languages are still being developed to such an extent that they can be used in our higher institutions of learning. It's a process, but we are willing to wait. But right now, let us allow ourselves to be taken out from our comfort zones as black students, we have allowed that. Let white students do the very same thing. And I think we can have a way forward from that point onwards. Thank you very much. Okay, so Duane, um, then we'll come back. We have uh, 10, min 10 minutes left officially. But right. uh, if the members want to continue, of course. I'll, I'll keep it quick then. Um, I think, Chair, it's also important to know that this discussion is uh, I think, unfortunately, very politicized, um, and that makes a, a lot of assertions or uh, came as a result of, of that premise. Um, I just think that it's important that, to note that it's not equitable and in, in the basic definition of taking something away from someone and giving it, or may, uh, maybe reaching a neutral form of that application, if it is done so without substance. And that's the thing, that's just basic I mean, it becomes dictatorial if it doesn't have substance or reason for doing so, if it doesn't have an actual substantive reason why it is done. So this is the thing, I actually only have two questions. The one is a statement and the other one is a question. Jay, the one is, um, is it the position of, um, like, uh, Professor Rafiwe, in this specific case, as a member of management, that we should dismantle Afrikaans at one of the campuses and then actively have a neutralized um, language policy and plan? Um, and then secondly to that, I, I have to say this, I'm still in wait of some substantive points as to why the dismantling or the destruction of one language results in the emancipation of a greater group of people. Okay, Jacques, and then we're coming back. I, then Prof. Lalendia, you've been... Okay. 
Thank you very much. Just to come back again, what are we doing now? We are framing the future of this institution's language policy. That's what we're talking about. We're swapping ideas now. So it's not going to help that we're going to start throwing each other here with all kinds of ideologies. I can also start throwing socialism ideologies in here, but that's not going to be the answer in solving this. We have the chance to build something, not continue breaking down the past and moving what happened there, but to actively progress going forward. So. It's, it's very important for me then also that in this approach that we, you know, it's a very emotional debate, but it's going to have an intellectual answer. But I mean, this is not going to work if we value students as statistics as well also. We must keep that in mind also that it's human beings studying here and people who are going to help form the future of this institution also. And I think a very important thing from the get-go is our attitude towards this thing as well. This will never work if we are going to have an attitude of I refuse to learn another language. I can honestly say here, yeah, I wish I was more fluent in more languages, as I said here today also. And I believe if it's one that's going to be compulsory at the NWU, it's going to make me a richer person the day that I leave here. If somebody can speak that, great, learn another language. But I would want to learn more. And I'm sad that I haven't had the chance to do it in an academic sense until this far. I've never been afforded that opportunity wherever I've gone. and it, It's made, made me poorer. So I think a very important thing also just to, to end off is the statement was made, why won't Afrikaans students come out of their comfort zone to help, you know, also give up something in reaching equity. But I think the, the important thing for us in this debate is quality. We want a quality education and a quality institution to build on a quality future. And our solution to that is not going to be an easy one. As Prof always says that for every complex problem, there's an easy solution which is wrong. That is not going to do how we're going to go forward. Going forward, we have to say, listen, let's start developing languages. That the language which I grew up in my home, I can go study in also, that I have a better understanding of the work. And when I go in the workplace, all of us can speak English. That I can effectively convey and implement the information that I had learned during the studies. Our, our solution to this whole discussion is not going to be, let's, you know, make each other poor so that nobody can be rich in this sense. That's not how we're going to be building on a future. Today we're building on the future and we're going to help, you know, plant in each other also, going to help invest in each other. And that's how we're going to go forward, not by taking away, but by building. Thank you. Okay. Profika made a very profound statement here that in the classroom, Perhaps we should uh, look forward to a situation where not one group experiences the interpreting uh, devices, Profika, but, you know, at any point. So, in fact, it can be everyone because it may be in Sesotho and the rest who can't understand Sesotho must go through. Prof. Lalende. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. I think you have touched on the area that I had an interest in. I think um, if we frame the debate, I'm more interested into issues of access within the university across the different campuses so that um, we don't have language standing there as a barrier in terms of uh, people accessing this important resource of the country. That's one aspect. Secondly, I think uh, I'm of the idea that uh, also how language plays itself into student success and then also what we call the student experience in all the three campuses of Northwest University. It must be uniform, equitable kind of um, experience. And if we can achieve those things, I think uh, to a large extent would have won uh, in respect uh, to our strategy and the things that we want to achieve as an institution, how to do it. That's a difficult part of it because to a large extent, we have a commitment to a multilingual context and we should keep to that particular context and uh, deal with the implementation uh, in a very innovative fashions, which I think we've got brilliant people in this university that would actually deal with the implementation that will not compromise the values that we stand for. Thank you, Chair. Okay, shall we entertain other tweets? Did you see a tweet you want to respond to? Oh, yes, yes. After, after that? Is it a tweet? I want us no, to address tweet. some... Um, it's a response. To, okay. Okay, let's go and then Prof. Refilio, and then we can go to the tweets. Before is, we uh, is the colleague's name Daniel? Yes, please. Again? Lawrence. Thank you, Lawrence. And uh, I wish I knew Sepedi. 
I actually had one year of sabedi uh, as a first year student and I lost everything because I didn't have any exposure <laughs> to sabedi. I think what we need to keep in mind, uh, colleagues, is when speaking about coming out of comfort zone, let's be honest, uh, there's no comfort zone which you can leave be because of our bad history, our bad past. The, some of our South African languages have not been developed as scientific languages. So there was no sacrifice. It's actually the second best getting tuition in not your mother tongue is the best because there's no other option. Now I think that we must be, we must show respect and social justice sensitivity to say, well, some of the students on the campus have the privilege to be utilizing their home language. 9% English, 20% Afrikaans. Let's not create a situation where social justice is absent. And I say, because I don't have the privilege of using my home language, you also must sacrifice that privilege. But where you were absolutely right is if, like many of the tweets, the starting point is, I don't want to sacrifice anything. I'm, that's not the value of our institution. I must, if I am privileged because of what we have, either with the English or the Afrikaans, then I will say, I want to, I'm willing to sacrifice for the greater good, and then also, it's a, the greater good not of our institution, it's the greater good for me as well, because I think I'm sacrificing, but I'm actually gaining what Professor Robert Belfort said. I, I will be gaining in the process the more languages, and I know the truth, the more languages I know, the more times I am a human being. So let's move away, uh, uh, Clement, from the idea that because I don't have the privilege of using my home language, no other person should have that <coughs> privilege. Let's not go there. Let's accept it as a fact of history, and let us demand Mutual sacrifice, yes, but not say because I don't can't use my home language, you are also not allowed to use your home language. Okay, then yeah. Um, I'd just like to make a point, uh, particularly as a first year BA law student. Um, most of the students that I actually speak to. Since this university, this is just based on the university as a whole. This, un this university is supposed to um, foster integration in terms of all the three campuses. The Mafiken campus, the Porch campus, and the VAR campus. So in that way, when all the BCom and the BA law students that I'm communicating with, when they speak of doing their LLB after they are done, they don't speak of Porch. They don't speak about coming to port based on the language policy as, as they would feel excluded. So I'll go back to the point that um, Sir said in terms of giving up something. This is a matter of compromise. You know, We have to compromise in order for all to feel excluded. So if one person says they'd prefer to go to another institution whereas facilities at port are available, but because of language, they're not gonna go there they'd rather go to VITS to complete a two-year LLP because of language. So it's a matter of sacrifice so everyone could feel excluded and so that integration with all the three campuses can happen. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, if I was understood to say that Africans must be dismantled, then I need to explain myself again. I'm a pragmatist. I believe in being strategic, but also being practical. And the point I was mentioning was that we are dealing with a complexity. And 
that complexity, we are not going to solve it overnight. And because we won't solve it overnight, we are taking good steps, having a policy and so on, but we will need to have a phased approach, some phased approach with immediate, medium, and long term. For example, the question is, what do we do now? For a student who goes to class tomorrow, what do you do now? With everything that we have said, what do we do now for such a student? And I want to mention this, that I have absolutely nothing against Africans. In fact, on the contrary, I love Af Africans because I had very good African teachers. The expressions that I can still make today that I was taught at a very early age. So, so it <coughs> has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the practicalities, the inclusivity, the equal experience, and the rest of the other things that others have said, and I'm thinking along those lines, practicality. And just the tweet I'm responding to here that says, uh, let's develop Pedi universities and Setswana universities, Zulu universities. I mean, unless if one does not know the history of this country, and that's the danger of forgetting history because you go back to it, this will definitely be apartheid through the back door. It is, dis it is actually disappointing and discouraging to actually have anyone, any South African, still thinking in terms of separate development as the best way to go. That's all I can say. <coughs> oh, sorry, Prof. Yeah. You guys have had a time. Chair <laughs> President, thank you for social justice. I have giving me this opportunity. Um, I think I'm responding to the first tweets that, that happened today, and um, those tweets were disturbing because they were hateful. So there are tweets coming from a place of hatred, a place of bitterness, and a place of anger. And I think university management, by simply trying to forge ahead with a new strategy, and a new language policy for the new unitary university is simply trying to, to ensure progress. And in, in the vision statement, we, which some have alluded to, we, we are speaking we are from a point of where we want to encourage, um, maintain and even build out excellence, academic excellence, because we do want to be in the top five in South Africa. We are currently six. We do want to be in the top 20 in Africa. We can't be 26. We do want to be in the top 500 in, uh, globally. We are currently 800 and something. Uh, and, and this is exactly what the language po policy aims to do. The language policy aims to improve and, 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 and widen access and success so that we can cultivate a larger group of students to be excellent because we have all the facts and the statistics which show that many students are not doing as well as they should in terms of their potential. So I think the new language policy is an attempt to actually maintain and build on the current excellence of the university. It is a good university. I won't go as far as saying it's great. We need to, we need to go further to become great. And also the language policy is trying to actually also um, accommodate social justice. And I, I think that the hateful tweets point to the fact, as was alluded to earlier, that it's difficult, but somehow we have to try and depoliticize the language debate at universities. It will be difficult given our histories, but we have to depoliticize the debate and we have to de-racialize the debate in order to make sense of it. If we're going to use ideologies as the points of departure, then we're not going to get to a practical solution. Because at the end of the day, we have to have practical solutions to implement it. And what I miss in the debate is, so yes, we have a new strategy. Yes, we have a history. Yes, we have all these legal documents, um, Higher Education Act, Constitution, and so on. 
but we're not the first to have these kinds of language debates. H have we looked at the situation in India, which is a vast country with many more languages than South Africa, with many more provinces, and somehow they've come to an accommodation that English is the language of medium of instruction, followed by Hindu, which is a big language, but it's mainly a practical language. I don't know of any universities in India that actually have Hindi as their main language of instruction. Or have we thought of Hawaii, where they had indigenous language, the Polynesian language, and they are using English today. So in some situations in the world, English is a practical solution. It's not that we're embracing <laughs> colonialism. It's not that we're embracing um, the, the British Empire or the old British Empire that we're using English. It's simply a practical solution. And so, so in the debate, we, we, ha we have to keep those things in mind. That, um, and, and, and also, we, although we have 11 or 12 official languages with sign language, we, we cannot, in, in all practicality, accommodate all languages. So we would wish to accommodate languages like Isi, like Isi Zulu, which we should in terms of 12 million people speak Isi Zulu. So if you want demographic justice, demographic language justice, Zulu should be one of the languages, should be a language. But we know that Isi Zulu and Isi Koza and Setswana and Sesotho has not been developed to the point where we can offer modules in, in those languages right now. And there might not even be a desire on the part of those people to want to use those languages now, because how long will it take to develop? We've heard it took Afrikaans 60, 70 years to develop from a, a basic language to an academic language. And most of our people cannot wait 60, 70 years. That's a lifetime then they did. And we've heard earlier on, uh, Prof. Fulman mentioned about competitiveness. To be competitive as a, a South African universities and South African economy, which is ailing at the moment, we need our people to get up and running as soon as possible. And it seems to me that we can come with all kinds of fancy academic arguments that we shouldn't be monolingual or unilingual. But it's obvious to me that whatever our language backgrounds, we have to adopt one language as a lingua franca. And in fact, the world says that sub-Saharan Africa's lingua franca appears to be English rather than Swahili. And Northern Africa's lingua franca or Western Africa seems to be fr French. So from a practical point of view, where you have to grow an economy and you have to grow expertise and people are, and we have a brain drain, what choices do we have? I'll, 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 st I'll stop with that question. Okay, um, we are 10 minutes over time. I am in your hands, um, but I think we must come to some conclusion. Um, <coughs> Prof. Dan, I don't know. You, uh, are these life changing? Remember the policy discussion? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I know they are life changing. <laughs> um, uh, in terms of the policy process, you, the, that language audit continues and engagement with the other structures is still coming. So, the framing I want to believe for these papers, we have framed and contextualized. So, uh, I don't know, are these, um, will the price of bread have changed if you don't make them, uh, Lawrence? Yes, I think if I if I say this, this will make a difference in terms okay. of uh, when they do structure this uh, the language policy. Um, if we 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 go by the suggestion of the professor over here, the problem is you are going to uh, experience resistance. Mm. You are going to res experience huge resistance, and it might turn to 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 numbers. Uh, the, the, the quality of academics at this university falling. That's number one. Number two, the, the, uh, um, us addressing this language policy is, of, uh, is so important. I could even say that uh, the progress or the future of the university depends on it. Because if you look at it, the only way for our university to grow is if we use one language for the entire institution. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, you realize we are not fixed on any single position here. And the inputs are all good to go and help formulate uh, what will be in the best interest 
of, of, of the university. <clears throat> and I just request that as and when we leave here, let's go and now try and add value to the debates around this. These speeches or positions based on hatred must just be relevant. Let people understand that's not the departure point. Some of these positions that are based on, you know, fixed and rigid on, on either a privilege or on ideologies, that's not the basis in which we can determine and direct the university. You know, positions like uh, uh, away with Africans, we know, that cannot even, it's not a departure, it's a starting point. Positions like there are many other universities offering in English. We must go there. This one is an Afrikaans one. We do not have such, and we do not intend to create such an English or Afrikaans or Setswana University. Universal, as Prof. Uh, Mafuya indicated, you know, it's not something that can be localized to that ideological point. We have the global community, and we need to be the, uh, the com uh, belong to that community. So thank you very much, colleagues, for, for this engagement. Let's continue. And the last thing I would want us to, I, wa I want to say is, let's go out there and provide the leadership. The leadership is not the easiest thing. To go and convince and swim sometimes against the stereotype the streams and waves out there, it's not, uh, that easy, but we have the responsibility to provide direction to this beloved institution of ours and also to our country. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Prof. Dan. Colleagues, thank you. Uh, I wasn't supposed to be a fair and neutral chairperson. <laughs> <laughs> This is a debate. Uh, the only neutral and fair chairperson is the priest. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you very much. As Prof. Prof. Dan has said, let's go out there and, uh, you know, debate constructively. You will be disappointed if you came here thinking we are going to find a solution for the, for the, for the language policy. That's not the intention. And I, I think the context was to say what motivates the change of policy what is the view of Prof. Den and the other, the task team and everyone else, everyone who was here, the view counted. There is this message that I need to talk about that this is just a fluke, a decision has already been made. I think this is really, in actual fact, uh, casting as patience on the integrity of our council. It, I view it in a very serious light because really, it's, even when us as staff members or students are, are saying things like this, we are operating outside the agreed framework of engagement. I think we must avoid that. Let's participate in the language policy audit. Let's participate in the faculty engagements that will be happening. And uh, let's find each other, the South African way. Thank you very much. Thanks.